we want to let you in on a secret. You can innovate. A gym teacher needed a sport to play indoors during winter months. A blind teenager needed a system for reading. A student kept forgetting his flash drive. Notice a pattern? Innovation often starts with real people solving their own problems, innovating for their own use. This is User Innovation. Believe it or not, it's all around you. Sports, medicine, software, food, you name it. But how do you become a user innovator? How do you get your idea out into the world? To answer these questions, we'll take a look at real-world examples interview people like you who solve their own problems and meet MIT professor Eric Van Hippel who pioneered the study of user innovation. Online education is one of the fastest growing, most accessible ways to learn. I know you all know about online education because you're watching it right now. Many organizations today are innovating in online education, MIT, edX, Coursera, Udacity, but one of them was created as a user innovation, Khan Academy. Khan Academy is an online educational platform for people of all ages from all over the world. Right now, I'm using Khan Academy to study the history of music, while my daughter Maria, Maria, Hi. <laughs> is using it to learn to count. But how did Khan Academy Come to be. How would a Khan Academy come to be? In 2004, MIT alumnus Salman Khan began tutoring his teenage cousin Nadia in math. Unfortunately, Nadia lived across the country, so Sal had to teach her over the phone. To illustrate concepts, Sal used online software to write out equations while talking to Nadia. However, Meeting on the phone was inconvenient, so he began recording videos for Nadia. Nadia actually preferred the videos to learning on the phone, because the videos gave her the ability to review the material as many times as she needed. Soon, other family members and friends began asking Sal to tutor them. He didn't have the time to teach them individually, so he began posting videos to YouTube. Word spread quickly, and soon, thousands of people across the globe were watching his videos. He received letters thanking him for his online lectures and the learning opportunities they had provided. Salman realized the importance of providing easily accessible education to people around the world and became so committed to this cause that he quit his job in finance in order to create educational videos full time. Khan Academy has a huge community of users, yet Salman Khan decided to give the innovation away for free. Huh. Meet Daria. Daria is an oceanographer and scuba diver who cares deeply about the health of the world's oceans. Over the last century, Scientists have observed a steady increase in the temperature of the oceans. This change in climate can have a dramatic effect on plants, animals, and the world at large. To protect the oceans, scientists need to collect temperature data for research. But the ocean is huge and their sampling is limited. So Daria thought of a way to increase sampling by uniting the millions of divers worldwide to contribute temperature data. Daria, you are an oceanographer. You study the ocean. What is it like to be an oceanographer? It's amazing. Imagine your office is in the middle of the ocean and there's no land in sight for miles in any direction. That's so cool. 
You know, I know it sounds like a great life to have, but it does come with its own challenges. For example, how do you get the funding and the sea time when there's so much competition for research funding to study the thing you're passionate about? And even if you do, the ocean is so big and yet we can only study such a small part of it and get data, but we just don't have enough manpower and funds to constantly monitor the health of our oceans and understand more about it. What could scientists do with the data collected? Monitoring the temperature of our oceans is very important because we already know that the ocean temperature is rising. And this has implications in fisheries management. For example, imagine a local community that depends on fishing for their economy. And with the warming of the oceans, the fish that they're used to catching will be moving north to colder waters. That could be devastating. That could for be devastating. They economy. could lose their entire livelihood. That local community could just disappear. Um, it has implications in conservation. Manta rays, for example, or other large animals like whales, um, uh, sharks, their behavior and migration might follow food patterns, which is directly related to the ocean temperature. What's the plan? Well, let me tell you a story. I was in Hawaii for a conference, and naturally I skipped all the conference sessions and went diving. I don't blame you. Uh, I was sitting on the bottom of the seafloor, and I saw a diver in the background just descending to the bottom. And I looked at him and I thought, he's actually a temperature sensor. He's sampling the ocean temperature as he descends because divers wear dive computers which look like oversized watches like this and they have thermistors in them. So every dive every diver has done has a temperature observation. That night I went back to the hotel room and I bought the domain name Divers for Oceanography with the intention of setting up a platform where scuba divers from all around the world would submit temperature data and then scientists who need these data would come and download and use it for their research. Is the idea to share the data for free? Yes. Let's recap. There is a solution. Divers for oceanography. Darian knows that divers always wear dive computers that record ocean data, including temperature information. Divers from around the world can submit this data to the Divers for Oceanography website enabling the organization to build an enormous catalog of information. This catalog is freely available to anyone in the world, including scientists who can use the data to improve the health of the ocean and its creatures. Daria has a great and noble idea. She is even offering it for free. But is that enough to create a successful community? To talk about that, we are going to Eric Van Hippel. So, Erdine, what do you have for me today? Daria, Divers for Oceanography. Seems like a really useful idea. What's more, Daria is looking to get it out there for free. Mm -hmm. Is that enough? I know Daria, and it's a very cool thing uh, that she's trying to do. Uh, what she's trying to do is called peer-to-peer -peer diffusion. Interesting. Would you define this for us? Well, when you try to distribute an innovation you've made, you can either do it by the marketplace, which is what companies do, they want you to buy it, or you can do it colleague to colleague, user to user. Friend to friend. For free. Exactly. And that's what Daria is trying to do. Well, it's worth it for Daria because she's getting unprecedented research data. Yeah, so she really wants it. She can save research money and all the rest of that, help the oceans, all those things she wants to do. Yeah. So the question for her is, well, but what are the benefits on the other side that will induce those divers to do it for her on a long-term basis? But she's giving it away for free to the divers. The divers don't really have to pay anything. So what's, uh, what's the challenge there? Yeah, so she's giving the idea away for free, she might be giving away the content, mm -hmm. but they have to supply the effort. That's not free. This is really interesting. What is the cost and benefit for the divers contributing the information? She says it's already on their dive computers. That's true. 
but how do they get it off the dive computers and over to Daria? If she can make that as easy as Wikipedia, maybe she's got a good situation. If it's hard, then she doesn't. They might not want to carry through. Yeah. Once she sees the costs, she can say, oh, well, maybe I can make it more fun for them. I can lower their costs. I can make it a video game. You know, I can create a leaderboard so everybody knows who's first. Yeah, there's community recognition. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. This is true for any user innovator who wants yeah. to diffuse things. So think about decreasing costs for the adapter and increasing the benefit for them as well. That's right. Yeah. Now, her diffusion costs are worth it because she gets all that data. But that's not always the case. Most user innovations are different. Let me tell you a personal story. If I those are the best. So I had a tendon problem with my ankle. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine now. Good. But I went to the surgeon and he said, oh, you know, kid, it's inflamed. Put on this big heavy boot and walk around with it for two months. <laughs> like a skier who lost his skis. Yeah, 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 exactly. A big ski boot. You couldn't bend at the ankles and so on. So I tried it for a week, you know, and I went back and I said, geez, I can't even walk in this thing. And he said, yeah, well, you know, that's the way it is. <laughs> so I went to the hardware store and I just got some stuff and I, I built something that just reinforced that particular tendon instead of the whole boot thing. That's really cool. Yeah, worked fabulously. I was perfectly willing to give it away to anybody. Of course. I went to the surgeon and said, hey, look at this. He said, well, pretty cool. Have you got it FDA approved? And I said, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm just trying to give it away. And he said, well, do you know it doesn't have any bad side effects? No, didn't have any for me, but I don't know about other people. Sure. So for general adoption in that case, I would have had to do a lot more than I was willing to do. Well, it would be a full-time job for you and then some. Yeah. yeah. And, and I wouldn't want to do it. So even though you're giving it away free, Free isn't always free. The adopter has costs, and you as the giver have costs to make it easy to adopt. I was the user innovator. That's right. But it wasn't worth it to me. It's um, of great benefit to adopters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But your cost is. Yeah. So I guess the point of it is, it's not just that we have to think about cost and benefits for the adopter and the innovator, is that the cost and benefits are not static. You can be creative about them, decrease them, or increase them if we're talking about benefits. Exactly right. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, Eric, great to see you. Good I want to go you. and check back in with Daria. All right. Now, let's check back in with Daria and find out what motivates her to invest herself into divers for oceanography and what her plans are for the development of this community. Daria, let me understand. You're investing a lot of time into divers for oceanography and you're not expecting monetary benefit? No, absolutely not. Why does this choice make sense for you? Well, not everything is done for a monetary return, that's for one. But really, this is about the satisfaction of being a part of a global project that helps preserve something they deeply care about, which is the ocean. So for me, it's more about engaging the volunteers, the divers, to take part and, you know, f and feel good about themselves while doing good to the planet. And you believe that other divers will voluntarily and happily contribute data because just like you, they care about the ocean. Yes, exactly. Um, people often ask if divers are going to be paid for submitting their data. And they're not going to be because no sponsor in the world would fund a project this early on that would pay for every data point that will come in, which will be a lot of data points. Um, but second, really, I don't believe that divers would expect compensation for um, sharing what they already have collected uh, with the scientific community that will use it for the benefit of the oceans. You're just starting out with divers for oceanography. In the past, you used to be a software developer. And uh, as you know, in uh, open source software development projects, many people contribute voluntarily code, but they also benefit because they get recognition 
in the community, and that recognition often translates into jobs and other opportunities. Can you envisage something like this for your diving community too? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready to think about that. That's okay, that's okay. Daria wasn't quite ready to talk about incentives for the diving community. So we caught up with her a few months later over Skype. Daria! Hi, Ardine. How are you? Doing great. The course is live. It's awesome. Fabulous. What's happening? Where are you now? I'm home in Urla, Turkey. Bring it on. Hey, uh, Daria, we want to follow up with you and ask a few more questions. Sounds good. Looking at it as a diver, I can see that I could find it emotionally rewarding to submit data. You know, here I am sharing the data and the data is helping citizen science. Can you think of other rewards for divers? Sure. For the individual divers, uh, our software is going to allow them to make profiles. So that allows divers to connect, uh, either connect people who have gone diving in the places that they're interested in or find a buddy who plans to go to a particular site in the near future uh, and uh, even upload photos from their dives or make notes about anything unusual they might have noticed uh, using the Divers Proceanography platform. That's really awesome. And uh, the most important question that needs to be asked is, uh, will anyone be posting pictures of mermaids? <laughs> well, you never know what you might see, yes. And okay. by the way, can temperature data be useful to divers themselves? Absolutely. Uh, let's say you want to go diving this weekend in Orla. You can scan the Divers for Oceanography platform for the most recent data on Orla for the particular dive site you want to go to. Cool. So what are you going to do to make it easy for divers to submit their data? I'm going to take advantage of technology. Some of the newer dive computers have uh, USB cables that connect to desktops or laptops and with those computers come a software that is basically a digital logbook. It's just like an Excel file that keeps track of your dives and it automatically downloads from your dive computer. So our software is going to interface with these existing digital logbooks and at that point all the diver will have to do will be to say send the data to divers for oceanography and we will receive temperature information without the diver having to type anything additional. Wow, almost completely automated. The diver will still have to click send, but yeah. that's about it. No manual data entry, nothing. That's really cool because uh, it's clear that some divers are already doing that and then in the background the data could be seamlessly uploaded to your platform. Exactly. What is your long-term plan for sustainability? This is nonprofit and we're all curious, how are you going to make it sustain itself, survive? All the uh, resources that have been put into this project so far, including time and money, are uh, basically donated by volunteers. It's our own time, it's our own uh, resources. But that can only continue up to a point. There are small grants we are eligible now, which we are working on getting. These are Some of these are government, some of these are non-governmental, private uh, do donors and some diving uh, related communities but there will be a time when the most appropriate and the sustainable step to take for the future of this project will be to host it uh, in a academic institution or a governmental institution which will have the infrastructure, the hardware uh, and the manpower to maintain uh, and upgrade the system as more data come in. So to get it started you are relying on collaboration of some you know skilled passionate people then small grants will help you show proof of concept that this is viable this is valuable and then you will integrate with a larger research institution to really bring diverse oceanography to critical mass. That's exactly right Ardeen. It's really cool and um, I really hope it comes to full fruition. Like, really, uh, it's an awesome project. Thank you, Ardine. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I look forward to seeing you in Cambridge. Enjoy the travels. Don't lose the passport. All right.
<laughs> Take care. So, what did we learn here today? Peer-to-peer -to -peer diffusion happens when an innovation is shared without the exchange of money. But free isn't always free. Adopters and innovators both have costs. And it's up to you to make diffusion worth it for both sides by reducing costs and increasing benefits. So why is it important? Users benefit from their own innovations. That's fabulous. But if society is going to benefit as a whole, those innovations have to get out there to others. Peer-to-peer -peer diffusion is everywhere. How to do it is something very important for user innovators to learn. So the question is, how will you share your solution?